Spanish dialanthe. Fairy rebels have not been what they were. My Alanthe was the life and soul of Fairyland. Why, she wrote all our songs and arranged all our dances. We sing her songs and we trip her measures, but we don't enjoy ourselves. To think that five and twenty years have passed since she was banished. What could she have done to deserve so terrible a punishment? Something awful. She married a mortal. <gasps> Is it injudicious to marry a mortal? Injudicious? Why, it strikes at the root of the whole fairy system. By our laws, the fairy who marries a mortal dies. <gasps> but Iolanthe didn't die. No. Because your queen, who loved her with a surpassing love, commuted her sentence to penal servitude for life on condition that she left her husband and never communicated with him again. That sentence of penal servitude, she's now working out on her head at the bottom of that stream. Yes. But when I banished her, I gave her all the pleasant places of the earth to dwell in. I'm sure I never intended she should go and live at the bottom of a stream. It makes me perfectly wretched to think of the discomfort she must have undergone. Think of the damp! And her chest was always delicate. <laughs> and the frogs! Oh! I never shall enjoy any peace of mind until I know why Iolanthe went to live among the frogs. Then why not summon her and ask her? Why? Because if I set eyes on her, I should forgive her at once. Then why not forgive her? Twenty-five years. It's a long time. Think how we loved her. Loved her? What was your love to mine? Why, she was invaluable to me. Who taught me to curl myself inside a buttercup? I Who taught me to swing upon a cobweb? I Who taught me to dive into a dewdrop? To nestle in a nutshell? To gamble upon gossamer? I she certainly did surprising things. <laughs> <laughs> then give her back to us, great queen, for your sake, if not for ours. Oh, I should be strong, but I be marble, I but I am clay. Her punishment has been heavier than I intended. I did not mean that she should live among the frogs, and, well, it shall be as you wish. It shall be as you wish.
decide to live at the bottom of that stream? It's been near my son, Streffer. Bless my heart, I didn't know you had a son. He was born soon after I left my husband, by your royal decree. But he does not even know of his father's existence. How old is he? Twenty-four. Twenty-four? No one to look at you and think you had a son of twenty-four. But that's one of the advantages of being immortal. We never grow old. Is he pretty? He's extremely pretty. But he's inclined to be stout. Oh. I see no objection to stoutness. <laughs> <laughs> and what is he? He's an Arcadian shepherd. And he loves Phyllis, a ward in Chancery. A mere shepherd? And he half a fairy? Oh, he's a fairy down to the waist. But his legs are mortal. Oh, I have no reason to suppose that I am more curious than other people. But I must confess, I should like to see a person who is a fairy down to the waist, but whose legs are mortal. Well, nothing easier, for here he comes.
the court of chancery. My lord, I know no laws of chancery. I go by nature's acts of parliament. The bees, the breeze, the seas, the rooks, the brooks, the vales, the gales, the mountains, the fountains. Cry, if you love this maid, take her, we command you. It is writ in heaven by the bright barbed dart that leaps forth into lurid light with every grim thundercloud. The very rain pours down in sad and sodden sympathy. When chorus nature bids me take my love, shall I reply nay? For a certain chancellor forbids it. My lord, you are Lord High Chancellor of England. But are you Chancellor of birds and trees, King of the winds and Prince of thunderclouds? No. <laughs> That's a very nice point. I don't think I ever met it before. But my difficulty is that at present there is no evidence before the court to suggest that chorus nature has interested herself in the matter. No evidence? But I give you my word, I tell you. She told me, take your love. Ah, oh, but good sir, you mustn't tell us what she told you. It's not evidence. Now, an affidavit from a thunderstorm, or a few words on oath from a heavy shower, would be met with all the importance they deserve. And have you the heart to apply this prosaic rule of evidence to a case that bubbles over with poetical emotion? Distinctly. I have always kept my duty strictly before my eyes. And it is to that fact that I owe my advancement to my present distinguished When I went to the bar as a very young man, said I to myself, said I, I'll work on a new and original plan, said I to myself, said I, I'll never assume that a broker or a thief is a gentleman worthy implicit belief, because his attorney has sent me a brief, said I to myself, said I. Ere I go into court, I will read my brief through, said I to myself, said I, and I'll never take work I'm unable to do, said I to myself, said I. My learned profession I'll never disgrace by taking a fee with a grin on my face when I have been there to attend to the case. Judge who is not able white, said I to myself, said I. Or assume that the witnesses summoned in force and exchequer things bench common pleas and divorce and perjure themselves as a matter of course, said I to myself, said I. In other professions in which men engage, said I to myself, said I. The army, the navy. The church and the stage, said I to myself, said I. Professional license and carried to a bar, the chance of promotion will certainly bar, and I fancy the rule might apply to the bar, said I to myself, said I. Seven years of penal servitude. 
inactive, see my fortunes fade. No, no, oh, no. no. Mighty protectress, hasten to my aid.
Mary, I'm in the nice warm dairy, all pasty turned with dames unknown. I ought to be more cherry. It seems that she's a fairy from Anderson's library, and I took her for the proprietor of a lady's seminary. Oh, it's 
ridiculous protégé of yours is playing the deuce with everything. He might, as the second reading of his bill, to throw the spirit open to competitive examination. And he'll carry it too. Carry it? Of course he will. It's a parliamentary pickford. He carries everything. Yes, if you please. That's awful. The deuce it is. Yes, we influence the members and compel them to vote just as he wishes. It's our system. It shortens the debates. But think what it all means. I don't so much care for myself, but with a house of peers with no grandfathers worth mentioning, the country will go to the dogs. I suppose it must. I wouldn't want to say a thing against brains. I, I, I have great respect for brains. I awfully wish I had some myself. <coughs> but with a house of peers composed entirely of persons of intellect, What's to become of the House of Commons? <laughs> I never thought of that. That's what comes of women interfering in politics. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No. If there is an institution in Great Britain that is not susceptible of any improvement whatsoever, it is the House of Commons. <laughs> Oh, 
So we are. Uh, at least I am. So am I. Oh, no, no. I am indeed very plain. <laughs> well, perhaps you are. <laughs> There's really nothing to choose between you. If one of you is to forego his title and distribute his estates amongst his Irish tenantry, well, then I should see reason for accepting the other. Tor, are you prepared to make this sacrifice? No. Not even to oblige a lady? No. Not even to oblige a lady. Then the only question is, which of us shall give way to the other? I think, on the whole, she would probably be happier with me. I don't know. I, I may be wrong. No, I don't think that you are. I really think she would. But the awkward part of the thing is, that if you rob me of the girl of my heart, we must fight, and one of us must die. It's a family tradition I have sworn to respect. It's a difficult position, for I have a very strong regard for you, George. Oh, my dear Thomas. You are very dear to me, George. We were boys together. At least I was. <laughs> if I were to survive you, my existence would be hopelessly embittered. Then you must not do it. I say it again and again. If it will have this effect upon you, you must not do it. No, no. <clears throat> if one of us is to destroy the other, let it be me. <laughs> no, no. Oh, I insist upon a boyish friendship, I implore you. Be it so. But, but no, no, I cannot consent to an act which will crush you with unfailing remorse. But it would not do so. <laughs> I should be very sad at first, of course. Who would not be? But it would wear off. My dear Thomas, I like you very much. But not perhaps as much as you like me. <laughs> George, you are a noble fellow, but that telltale tear betrays you. No, George, you are very fond of me, and I cannot consent to an act which would, which would give you uh, uh, a week's uneasiness on my account. But it wouldn't last a week. <laughs> Remember, you lead the House of Lords, and upon your demise, I shall take your place. Oh, Thomas, <laughs> it wouldn't last a day. <laughs> now, I do hope you're not going to fight about me, because I really don't think it's worth it. Well, I don't believe it is. Nor I. The sacred ties of friendship are paramount. Oh, perhaps I may incur your blame. The things of you I would not do in friend. Love, hopeless love, 
my heart and soul in covers. Love, nightmare-like, lies heavy on my chest and weaves itself into my midnight slumbers. When you're lying awake with a dismal headache and reposes to boot by anxiety, I conceive you may use any language you choose to indulge in without impropriety. Be your brain is on fire, the bedclothes conspire, of usual slumber to plunder you. First your couch of goes and uncovers your toes, the sheets slips demurely from under you. Then your blanketing tickles, you feel like these pickles so terribly sharp as the pricking. And your heart and your cross, and you tumble and toss till there's nothing to do with the ticking. Then the bedclothes all creep to the ground in a heap, and you pick them all up in a tangle. Next your pillow resigns, and politely declines to remain at its usual angle. When you get some repose in the form of a dose with hot eyeballs and head ever aching, when you're slumbering teams and such horrible dreams, and you'd very much better be waking, for you dream you are crossing the channel and tossing about in a steamer from Harwich, which is something between a large bathing machine and a very small second-class carriage, and you're giving a treat, penny ice and cold meat, to a party of friends and relations. They're a ravenous horn, and they all came on board as those where and South came into station. And back on that journey, you find your attorney who started that morning from Devon. He's a bit undersized, you don't feel surprised when he tells you he's only 11. Where you're driving like mad with this singular land by the binder ships now a four wheeler. And you're playing round games, and he calls you bad names when you tell him the ties pay the dealer. Well, this you can't stand, so you throw up your hands and you find you're as cold as an icicle. In your shirt and your socks, the black silk, the gold drops, crossing Salisbury, playing on a bicycle. And he and the crew are on bicycles too, which they somehow or other invested in. And he's telling the tars or the particulars of a company he's interested in. It's a scheme of devices to get at low prices or goods from convicts to cables, which tickled the sailors by treating retailers as though they were all vegetables. You get in the space with the butter store trays, but must take off his boots with a boot tray. This lens will take push to this thing, as we'll shoot and he'll cross with mud like a fruit tree. The green rose and tree, you get grapes and green peas, cauliflowers, pineapples, and cranberries. Or the place we could plant cherry brandy or brown apple puffs and three corners of batteries. The shares are a penny and ever so many are taken by Ross Town and Mary. And just as a few are a lot of people, you will wake when I shut in this bear. You're a regular wreck with a crick in your neck, and no wonder you stole for your heads on the floor, and you need as a pinch of yourself to your shins, and your flesh is a creep, and you're left to sleep. You're cramping your toes and a fly on your nose, bluffing your lung and a feverish tongue, and a nurse is intense with the general sense, and you have to be sleeping in coma. But the darkness is myself. I presume to address myself in such terms 
which render it impossible for me ever to apply to myself again. It was a most painful scene, my lords, most painful. This is what it is to have two capacities. Let us be thankful that we are persons of no capacity whatever. <laughs> come, come. Remember that your lordship is a just and kindly old gentleman, and you need have no hesitation in approaching yourself so that it's done respectfully and with a proper show of deference. Do you really think so? Oh, I do. Oh, well, in that case, I will nerve myself to another effort, and if that fails, I resign myself to Young as my mother. 
And so do my aunts. I quite understand. Whenever I see you kissing a very young lady, I shall know it's an elderly relative. <laughs>
may not be, for so the fates decide. Learn now that Phyllis is my promised bride.
Stay.